Welcome to Petra Revolt. Today I'm making my way up north to go and speak to another legend of the Golden Era. So this guy rode 500 Grand Prix in the Golden Era. He still holds the current lap record around the Isle of Man TT on an RG500. Uh, he also done World Superbikes, British Superbikes, run a very, very successful British Superbike race team and also run a very, very successful talent cup, I suppose you could call it, series. So let's cut to the chase and go and have a chat with him. Rob Mack. So, Rob, it's a pleasure to have you here. I've got a few questions written down because I'm not too, my brain's not too good. I'm too old for you, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, for your racing, yeah, but like, I remember when you you um, you had your team and it was a successful team, wasn't it? Yeah. Obviously, you run yeah. Tommy Hill and... Yeah, well, think... we had, well, we started, um, took over his team player manager in uh, 91 with Lockton. I took, a, took the team on from Steve Parrish. And then so I rode um, and I won the championship and then we had Paul Brown. And then the, the big years was when we got the factory bikes for the boost. We had Mackenzie and Whittam and Mackenzie and Walker and Mackenzie and Hizzy. So that was a, that was a real strong time then. And you remember the Virgin time as well. Yeah. That was pretty good. Yeah, because Tom, like, I grew up with Tommy on motocrossing. Oh, ah, cool, right. And my brother obviously done your arse, it's cut. Oh, Cup yeah. as well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he wrote a few of your bikes. Yeah, I like most of them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was Tommy's lifeline. That Arsis Cup was, was it was a it was a fantastic series. Um, Andy Smith from Yamaha was involved with the original RD three hundred and fifty series, which is something similar of production bike. And um, it was, I think, it was Tommy's last roll of the dice. He's pretty much skinned. Yeah. And it was his last go, and he managed to scrape enough money to put together, and he was, he had, he had to win it. Yeah, you know, he was down to he was down to him and Kutchlow at the end. Yeah, but it, was, it didn't work out well for him. He pulled that. I remember watching it. He pulled that move at Cabwell Park, didn't they? Into the hairpin, and it was like. Yeah, and don't remind me about that because I was dragged into the <laughs> into the steward's office about that. There was a bit of kicking off, and a few parents kicking off for that. But yeah, like I say, it was his last roll of dice. I mean, I think a lot of those guys probably would have made it through, especially Crutchlow, those sort of guys, but not as fast as what we made it happen with the Arsys Cup. Yeah. You know, the exposure they got, you know, the TV I've, and, you it, know, they really put them up there. It helped my brother out big time in his career. And to be honest, that's, in my eyes, that's what we're missing now yeah. in the UK is something like that because yeah. we've got, we haven't got anything like that, like all in the same tent. No, well... All, it, all under the same banner, you know, same bikes. There's no, literally no... Com well, that, no one can argue. No, well, that's exactly why we did it because I was watching, and I was, I, I was raced, I raced all my life, and I'm a serious passion for racing. But I was watching a lot of the the, the young series, especially the young junior superstock, and it was just there was like such a disparity between someone like me when I started in my tranny van and having a go, and someone with a motorhome and three spare bikes and going to Spain testing, mm. doing a little bit of cheating. Like, oh. So I we talked with Yamaha about doing it, but then I pre presented it to Stuart Higgs to say, listen, I'll run the whole series and the bikes will be totally even. There'll be no cheating. There'll be no, you know, no false results because these guys with the trick bikes and, you know, the, 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 the guys with limited budget couldn't compete. So yeah. we said we're going to make a complete level playing field and I managed to get Virgin involved with it and, and then... A prize at the end of these guys get, getting a some from a factory deal or some contract, which has never been never been done before, no. and needs a lot of money to be able to do that, um, and that's the way it only it worked for me. So we got you know so we had the bikes and we took all the bikes back. The literally guys got the keys out of the hat at the start of the series, yeah. so the bikes were totally even. Um, we policed everything. It was a pretty major project to take on. You know, took every, you know we looked after everything. But it, it worked, and it's funny because a lot of the guys who had the trick bikes and, and were winning didn't enter, you know, because they knew it was a complete level playing field yeah. and they had no advantage. And it was just, I mean, there were quite a few races where they're going, I, 
why tell me why tell me those bikes that fast well if you want it you have it next week yeah yeah, yeah. and it was yeah. like that you know yeah. um i actually remember you done i think my brother come back to the r6 cup from super sport one year and he i think he had a similar situation with that like oh he's on a better bike so yeah. i think you actually swapped the bikes and yeah. and the result was no different exactly yeah i i just think that's like that series was an, a brilliant series yeah. and the amount of talent was coming yeah through, it was, yeah. well the first year was the best because you can't you can't have a, a series with that much talent every year because you're just not there, not coming through. The first year, second year, and it sort of fizzled out a little bit. Um, but the first year with Crutchlow and um, Tommy, Kieran, Clark, um, you know, it's really fantastic racing. And, yeah. And say so, so we had a fly on the wall TV series following it. Yeah. And that was getting a bigger audience than the actual BSB. Yeah. You know, it was the, um, we got a budget together to put, put a whole team together and placed it on channel four and, it, and that was fantastic yeah you know and it's, it was brilliant i mean with it was such a great time with it there's so, there some sad moments as well i mean you know we had um the natural born race i can't remember the guy who got killed on the road but he he struggled to get to get he was a bit of a crazy guy on the road mm. we'll have to try and find his name but um so this, his mate said he should go racing and um his dad came to me and said, can we get him? I said, well, I really need to have a license and do some race. So he did, he fast forwarded and got his license really fast, got got on the bike. I think he finished third, the very first race he ever did. And he got killed in the, in the, in between the next race. And, oh, so I know. So it was, a, it was like I say, a series totally even and just an opportunity for these young guys to come and, come and prove themselves. Yeah. So. No, it's brilliant. Anyway, let's get down to the main facts All right. about yourself. Okay. Some of the old stories. Yeah. I've got some notes written down, but like, um, I've done a lot of, um, what do you call it? I educate myself a lot yeah. when, because Steve Wheatman gave me the opportunity to ride an RG500 around a yeah. TT. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you're the lap record holder on an RG500, right. and okay. you still are. That was our aim to try and beat, <laughs> beat your lap record. But yeah. it was. Oh, how you done them times around there at, at in that era on them tires the way the roads were well the, the tracks the biggest thing the tracks changed so much now, yeah but yeah i don't know i mean i think i think the biggest thing was that i was so on the top of my game you know that 500 um that, that year just come back from the from the german grand prix where i qualified on the front row i qualified fourth the weekend before i qualified fourth at salzburg and we finished fifth and then in the GP, in the privateer, big guy turning up, and so I was so far, so sharp. The TT was a doddle, it really was. I loved it, and I knew my way around pretty well, but my riding level was such a high level that I didn't have to go mental. Yeah. You know, I was well within myself. Um, I just clicked, I just loved it, and I loved that bike, that, mm. that 500. It was underpowered against. Yeah, you know, at the Grand Prix, you know Suzuki was sort of pulling out and was running out of spares off the uh, out of the rubbish bin, basically keeping it going. <clears throat> but you could ride the absolute wheels off it. You know, it's one of those where you, when you've got no horsepower, you can ride them really hard, can't yeah, you? Yeah. And the chassis and everything, I just totally loved it. So, um, so at the TT, it was it was say the when I the senior when I won on the five hundred, I was in the middle of the GPs. So that I flew back from Nurburgring. To ride the thousand in practice, and the five hundred team travelled from Germany to the Alamann, and then it, when it got there, I practiced on that, and then I did the race on the Wednesday, and then they went back to Paul Ricard while I finished the classic on the on the on the XR sixty nine. So it was amazing TT period that, but yeah, the five hundred was it. <clears throat> it was brilliant fun to ride. It wasn't the best part of the TT because it's just a bit too light and peaky, but the uh, the XR sixty nine big thousand. Was the bike to ride? I don't know how you. When I got on that RG standard, yeah, I actually turned around to him. and I said, "How the hell do Rob?" Because yeah. obviously, I, I knew your stature from yeah, yeah. you know running the RC's Cup and stuff like that. And and I was like, "How the well, hell?" I was a bit small on that. that. Well, I wanted to be shorter, but uh, my racing weight was a couple of stone lighter. But like you say, then it. Um, I don't know. I just it, and and like at the time. It's the best bike I've ever had, you know, come from a privateer and I had my TJ and so on. And then he got on that and it just felt, oh, such a, you know, it's Randy Mamola's Rand Mamola ex-bike. So it came from Randy, yeah. you know, a little dwarf Californian yeah. to me. But somehow he made it work. Um, it just, it was the best bike I've ever had, so I made myself fit.
And then skull, but like the skull bayonet colours were quite cool. Actually, Mike, the other side of Petrol Revolt, he'd love it because he he's got a skull bandit replica road going on. Yeah. He, he was still. Yeah, he's still he got it. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So, and he has. He, he's wanted uh -huh. to try and get you on it. So, I've got a set of lilies upstairs. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it? Yeah. Yeah. So he's got. But they were just. They were like brilliant colours because obviously Suzuki bought the the Skull Bandit out, didn't they, to yeah. try and sell? It was sort of. Well, Scott, it was a it was a little, little last minute thing. Uh, Gary Taylor brokered the deal because Suzuki pulled out. Mm. So that we had a year with with no real backing. Um, and they just cut, keep, kept the team together, and we just went and did as many GPs as we could. And then Skull arrived in eighty five, yeah, eighty five. And uh, yeah, it just he got found the sponsorship in America. I met them, met the guys a few times. Um, didn't really go down that well. I don't think during the maturity to back it. You know, he, he didn't get me to put, it, to, <laughs> didn't get me to sample it anyway. But it was a great, cool design, wasn't it? Yeah, and it, and it was pretty different at the time. It was, and then like the Pepsi bike as well. It was that they were like real iconic, yeah, so iconic colours, weren't yeah, they? Because yeah. then you went on to ride the. How many years was you with Suzuki for? Well, it's, I started my, my professional uh, year with Suzuki in '83, and then I left them in '86. So I did three years then um, domestic, a couple of years, and then the 500s as a privateer type thing, and then um, went and then another year with them in '88 with, with Swamps. I was pretty much hired in '88 to be Swansea's um, nanny. I think um, I was quite. I was well. I'd been. I'd, I'd finished with Marlboro, and Kevin was coming over, and um, that was pretty much my job to look after him. Although I still wanted to do as best I could. Yeah, but, yeah. But the bike, uh, that bike. I mean, you had to go on Kevin. But that bike at that time was crap. Yeah. Honestly, if it, well, it, and you can see it uh, when we see it now. It's. Um, it's a bit of history and it's like ah oh. but like if you put that bike next to a factory honda or the you know the honda is there then the yamaha and the suzuki it just looks like something that's been thrown together yeah and, and, it, and it, it was when i went to suzuki in japan their r d um department was four guys mm. just trying to you know literally hitting t um expansion chambers and bolting together you know, on hrc yeah and then um, and then the bike was you know, more than average. Well, he was average, but Kevin, he made a difference. Yeah. Yeah. You know, without Kevin, that never gone anywhere. Because Neil, Neil said that when he rode for HRC, it was like a masterpiece, and everything yeah. fitted where it should have done. And yeah, then, beautiful. And then the Suzuki was. Yeah. He said exactly. He said it was so hit and miss. Yeah. And like it was so hard to get it in that window to work. Yeah. Um, obviously, they developed it over the years. It got a little bit better. Oh, in it? the but, end, it got better. My, I was the first year. And it was pretty raw then. And um, um, can I just tell a story? Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, 88, I was signed to go look after Kevin. I went to meet Kevin at Daytona, got to know him, and had a few, ended up having a few drinks and beating him up. <laughs> but uh, got to know him, got to know his parents. And then we, went, we both went to the very first test in Japan at Suzuki's circuit called Rio. And um, we both set out his proper scary circuit. Kevin had been a few times. At, 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 I'd never been before. So there's the whole Suzuki set up there. There's probably about 20 guys, Mr. Ito and a few technical guys and the guys from the, from the sort of Suzuki headquarters just wanted to come and see Kevin and me. And so we started doing, literally Kevin did like three laps, he came past where the garage was on his ass. The bike came first, about 100 miles an hour, and then Kevin came through and he's like, oh, he picked up, broke his wrist. So that was the end of his testing. And this was, this was like February time. First race was end of March at Suzuka. <clears throat> so he broke his wrist. Oh my God, Kevin. And you know, and I was meant to be the, the, the sort of backstop. I was an experienced Grand Prix guy. I came from Marby Yamaha. So I finished the test off. And two, two three more days testing. And loads of new stuff. But I was, and I'd come from a, I'd come from Marby Yamaha. Mm -hmm. So the, the Suzuka was pretty much um, raw. Anyway, we finished the test and got went into the into the design area, and all the guys sat there. About twenty guys sat there with their notepads. Well, Rob San, what do you think the bike? I'm going. Oh, bike is not so bad. It's coming better, but uh, for Suzuka, what do you think? I think maybe tenth position. Oh, what? And they were they, they were like falling on the swords. You know, it's like. But for me, that's what I saw it. So <clears throat> went to Suzuka. Kevin turned up. Literally cut his cast off won the race 
<laughs> was, oh, but I think I finished 10th, but he won the race, but it was, you need to go and uh, dig it out and watch it, it was a fantastic race. But it's only Kevin could have done it, it was unbelievable. Yeah. And obviously, I, feel, I don't know where I finished, I think I finished 8th, 9th, 10th, something like that. But that was my level. But, but Kevin just took the bike to the next level, there was no way that bike should have won. Do you think that was a little bit to do a lot with his riding style as well? Yeah. Because he had a real unique riding style. Real motocross. Yeah. Like, force it down. <clears throat> really weird style. It seemed to get a lot of feeling from the front. Which I, could, I tried to do it a few times, but you can't change yourself, can you? But but that and flipping just unbelievable hunger and determination and confidence, you know, and um, the whole factor of like the rainy factor and all of Americans who hated each other, they just pushed themselves so hard, and he just and it's okay, he was he was brilliant, mm. but it, uh, without him the. It, it would never have gone, never got any further. Yeah. It really wouldn't, you know, him, and then they kept hold of him. I mean, that, at the end of 88, I'm like, Kevin, you need to get a good buy, you know, and everybody was after him, you know, big dollars. But um, Suzuki, I think, you know, the amount of money HR spent on their bike, Suzuki just spent on Kevin. Yeah. You know, they do. They didn't have that budget or that technology, but if they had Kevin, they knew they had some, you know, somebody to compete with, you know. Yeah. Because if you look back, we done on petrol vault. We done like an RG five hundred store, and you look back with the, um, the I forgot the guy's name, the German guy who defected from East Germany and went oh, to yeah, Suzuki, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. and they Suzuki oh, yeah. were like a really, yeah. they were a really really small company, weren't they? Yeah. You know, like compared to Honda and yeah. Yamaha, oh, yeah. like they they were tiny. Yeah, yeah. Well, then that when they there was a risk this far, wasn't it? Um, but yeah, but even even later on, they were still the smallest. Mm. I think the, their priority has to be um, right all, all the time. And racing, you know, they were small, they were relatively small business. And like racing was like a sort of a nice flag waver, but not the be all and end all. Like, you know, it's not like HRC have a hundred racing company. Yeah. And that's the go racing. Yeah. You know, Yamaha's relatively small as well compared to compared to that. Yeah. But what they did for Mizuka, lovely people, really lovely people, the Japanese people I met, um, proper passionate guys who just made things happen, but literally things would turn up and there'd be like one set of exhaust would come with Kevin and, you know, then next week I might get one and then, it'd be, you know, it'd be little tiny bits come through every week, you'd never gearbox and a couple of more cylinders and then the people come in, carrying them in hand luggage, hand luggage, hand luggage you know, just, yeah. and then like one set, Kevin, did it work? Yeah, right, we're on it, you know. Yeah. Just like someone's knocked it up in the It is, it literally, yeah, we've had an idea, let's try this, you know. It was just, and it was like that, just suck it and see. Great times though. Yeah. It really was. So after your Grand Prix career, you went you went to do the World Superbike Series, didn't you? I did, I did. Well, I went to, I was sort of, um, I was out, I can't remember, well, I finished with um, Suzuki, Gary Taylor. He let me go r r right at the death, like in November. I thought I was still running with, with Kevin for another year. And then I got, I got my P45 really late, so I didn't have any jobs. And I should have made, well, I was just about finished with Grand Prix. I'd sort of, I'd sort of done what I could there. I was up against it a little bit, being a bit of a big lad <laughs> anyway. And it was getting tougher and tougher. I had to ride all my career. I felt like I had to ride over the top all the time, trying to keep up with Neil McKenzie. You know, there's never ever never got a chance to do that and pass them. I was always from here, you know. So it was always a bit I was always on the edge. And I was getting a bit tired of that. So I was ne nearly gonna retire. And then um I got a chance I can't remember how, how it'll happen now, but Padges. Do you want to have a go at World Superbike? Did that, did that, did that yeah, would you want to go at World Superbike? Or would you ride at Torrington the first round might be so we ended up riding the Padges bike. An RC30 and it was absolute nail. And they end up there's there's a quite a famous picture of me running over his his head at Donington at the World Superbike. He'd crashed and I had nowhere to go. I ran over his head and the front page of my front wheel is his, his head. And I crashed, broke my wrist, and that was that was the proper lowest point of everything. Then I thought, oh, what's the point? But then I thought I'm not going to give up because I I don't know, okay, I'd grab pre and had a few quid bits and bobs, but. Um, I slammed the letters and helmets and a few other bits, personal sponsors. And I went to Andy Smith at Yamaha and said, Can we have an OWO1? Um, 
Sue Padgett's and all that, and we, we built this bike. I had my wrist in a cast. Um, I had this bike in my, in my house in, in Scotland, converted my garage to a workshop, just literally me and my mates got it going, got the engine. Dave Collins, Dave Junior Collins, who worked for me at Suzuki, uh, he built the engine for me, literally cobbled it all together, set off to Hungary in this, this next round, world round, with a cast on, in my Padgett's van. This Padgett's van has done the rounds, it's got about three million miles on it, in the Padgett's van, me and my mates. I don't, I don't really know, I just couldn't, I didn't want to stop, and I still wanted, I still felt I could. So I went to Hungary, and uh, cut my cast off, and I finished third on the podium, I got the podium, Stanley stopped, stopped bike, and um, and then on the way home, I got a phone call from HRC, would I take Bubba Schobert's ride? So the 89, I ran up riding um, Gardner's old bike, 89 bike, 88 bike, uh, for another year at Grand Prix, so I got another year there, but that was just a stop cut, really. I was never going to get anything more than that. So then when I did that year, and then I finished that, and then I came back to the UK. and did a British Championship for a couple of years. Yeah. And what, um, you, your your career, your racing career ended with injury, didn't it? Yeah, well, yeah, 93. It did. My, my best buddy, uh, um, James Whitton, me and him, we, I was playing manager that year. And... Um, <clears throat> He'd won, he was unbelievable, it was a new year, it was a year of the YZF came out, I'd been running the OWO1, which I thought was a bit of a shopping bike compared to a Grand Prix bike, but then the YZF, YZF came out, and that was a proper shopping bike, but Whitton loved it, you know, it was the best bike he's ever been on, so he, we joined up as teammates, and he was fantastic that year, he just rode brilliant, and, um, and then uh, it got to, he won the championship with two rounds to go, I think, so he was at Mallory, and I was second, and I said, this, the first race, I said, I just need to finish this race, in top three or four around there, and I'll, and I'll finish second, and then you can do what you want. Right, okay, so I, I was leading, and then Jim Moody come past from Norton, and Whitton was behind me trying to get past like that. And we had a few laps to go. Anyway, he went on the inside of me at the S's at, at Mallory when there was no skating, lost the front, took me out. Oh. So I broke my, broke my thigh and my shoulder, and... So I was out, so that was it. But I was going to retire anyway, I had, I had enough. I'd, yeah. I'd totally, I didn't say anything to anybody, but I just, that was going to be my end of the year anyway. Yeah. So he just sort of pushed it on a little bit, and ruined my golfing career. Yeah. Because <laughs> so, that was quick, wasn't it? That, that used to be quick. Yes. Yeah. through there. Yeah. Well, we got the came. bank moved back a little bit, but still. And like, I think it would have been all, all right, but he just took, went down early, but... Yeah, that was really that was all a bit quick, wasn't it? Up to uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. That I mean, I think the best thing was was putting that chicane in one. I know. But, the um, but you well you, but Mario never used to have a bus stop neither. So no, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And then and then they tried putting that other chicane no. in, didn't they? Halfway oh, through Gerard, Gerard's and that that was a disaster, wasn't it? I don't know. Did you? <laughs> I'm famous for like two chicanes, one at Cadwell and one at Mallory. Yeah. Of all those good things I did in my racing career, yeah. <laughs> remember for two boxy chicanes. Oh, the one at Cadwell, I think, is all right. Well, I, I hated doing it, but like they were gonna, they weren't gonna get a license. Yeah. Unless they, unless they slowed that entrance into the bottom of the mountain down. Yeah. yeah. And I wanted to go up, you know, come down Mansfield, and go back up and come back down. There's like an old commentary box thing, and do a nice corner there. So you went, come down Mansfield, you went up again. Yeah but they don't have any money. So we just literally, me and John Reynolds have got bits of rope out and we're lining this chicane up in the grass with these yeah. big long ropes and there it is. It's actually worked out, right? It? Yeah, it's, it is all right, that, because, yeah, it was quick. But that was the best corner ever. I love that corner. In that Into the bottom of the mountain? Yeah, that left yeah. Big, big balls, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. loved it. Um, yeah, so, this, yeah, I'm, re I'm remembered for ruining lovely turkeys. <laughs> <laughs> but what about, so going, um, going, back to the beginning of your career how did the opportunities in grand prix come about well it, it i could see I, I never really had anything planned at all and i just literally like when i first started the club like, with, with my mates i literally say right wh what's on let's go can we get an entry and it was like that just load the van up and go and and all through my the sort of national uh, racing i did that i didn't really follow anything and then i got sponsored and got a decent um Running privateers, and I got picked up by Suzuki, 
in '83, and Suzuki had, were running uh, uh, Suzuki GB were running a Grand Prix team at the same time. So I thought if I could impress here, and the TT was a big thing. I'd done the TT as a privateer and showed promise, and the TT was a big thing to get you probably a ride with a domestic yeah. team. So Aaron Suzuki was big in the TT. They signed me pretty much for the TT, although I was doing okay in short circuits. I was mixing it with with the uh, Marshall and and those boys on my privateer bike. Uh, it was a TT was was the main thing, and then so I went to the TT, won my first TT with an eighty three, and um, and that got me the chance to ride a five hundred. They gave me as, as a present, they gave me a, the, one of those five hundreds to go to the Alabama, uh, to the Australian Swan Series at the end of the year, and that was my first sort of ride on a five hundred. Um, so I could see that Suzuki had a chance uh, of me getting on a five hundred, but I nearly signed for Honda anyway. It was all a bit. At the end of eighty two I was talking to Honda and then and Roger Marshall won the championship for Suzuki uh, and then at the last minute he switched to Honda. So I went I replaced him at Suzuki. So that was that that was the uh, going back to your question, that was the uh, my way out, if you like, the Suzuki route. You know, I got to know them really well. Lovely, lovely people. And ironically, it worked out well for me, but they lost a the sponsorship, Suzuki pulled out, Mamola went to Honda, um and then they were left with this team, literally just sat there with the bike. And I came pretty cheap. I just wanted to get on the bike somehow. So they went, they went with me. So it's a bit of a, so then 80, 80, 84, 85, so 84, 85, 86, it was a bit of a stop period for Suzuki until they found a decent sponsor again and, and then Kevin. But that period there were, you know, those couple of years just running on old crap. But it was brilliant for me. I was just like, just, just a young kid, just getting a chance. Yeah. And, you know, I did, the bike was old and and uh, not really competitive, but the team was the best team in the paddock. You know, they'd already they'd been there for three or four years with the factory Suzuki, you know, finishing second in the World Championship with Mamola, Mike Sinclair and um, and Gary Taylor, Matt Nogborn. They was the best team in the paddock. So although the bike was a bit tired, I didn't care because I was a young kid coming through, just give me a bike, let me have a go. I didn't yeah. have any circuits, but I had the best team around me. So it's a fantastic scenario for me. Yeah, and I you suppose know. it's not like there weren't a lot of limelight on you, so it was yeah, a no bit, pressure. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that, that's that's what what because I'm sort of middle writing a few memoirs, and there's no doubt that was the best part of my career. Going as an underdog, no expectations. So whatever you did was a bonus. You know, so to turn up to like Salzburg ring for the very first time, never see Salzburg, super super fast circuit on a on a pretty old Suzuki and get on the front row it's like my god you know you're a you're a complete legend yeah. you're walking down the paddock and you're high as a kite you know people go who's that guy you know who's that big freak <laughs> <laughs> you know Mike go back to the paddock and that these guys have you know they've been a very top team and now they're there with me and it was just a fantastic time it was such a close knit little team to go and give them a front row it's like oh you know so it was, it was an amazing time like I say anything you did was a bonus and never any pressure and then the TT come and, and, and I managed to do the double that second year again that was just you know fantastic for, for that sort of team yeah and the years with Yamaha was was they with when uh, Roberts were running when he was running to... no Agostini was, oh Agar yeah Agar was running the, the team then um, so I joined because he was it, again I'd, so I'd been riding the Suzuki the Skull Bandit and I'd been showing some promise a few people were talking to me because they knew what Suzuki was like and they could see I was big, so and I was doing pretty good. Like, well, it must be fairly handy. So I got to speak to a few people, um, but then that, that then Ago came in. I got a test on the Kajiva. That was there was an offer to ride that, and then Ago came in, and uh, it's like you know all year long I've been sort of following these bikes, you know, from a dis of hanging on for a few laps, and then oh, Eddie Lawson, you know. And then thinking, oh, if I had one of those bikes, watch me go, you know. And then I, and then I got one. <laughs> I was like, oh. And then they realised how good Eddie was. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know when you think you, you think you you can do it, and you're always looking at something else. But then when you get it, it's like, ah, these guys are pretty special. Yeah. You know, once you go to that next step. Um. So I had two years with Marlboro Yamaha, which again was amazing. Uh, again, looking back, he's probably. It, it wasn't the greatest. It, well, it was an amazing, amazing time. I was there at the time when um, there was Eddie and Kevin turned up, Rainey, you know, Christian Sharon, all those guys. It was definitely, it, 
I guess he's I'm biased because I was there is my era, but we talked to a lot of people. A lot of people loved that mid eighties era when the bikes were monsters, uh, and the and the top two or three rows all possibly could win races. If it didn't, if it didn't, it wasn't them. It was one of the, these Americans coming through. I think a, a little bit of my downside was that um, I didn't. I never really um, thought I deserved to be there. A lot of the time, you know, mm. it's like a chubby lad from Scunthorpe. And, and Eddie Lawson's teammates, like, how did that happen? And then I was always a little bit, I think I was too big anyway, but um, I was always a little bit in awe of, of the Freddie Spencer and, and Eddie the Mike of the Heroes, you know? Yeah, you didn't have the, the maybe the arrogance that you lost. No, I think when I come back home and I was like the man, like, yeah. you know, no one, no one would pass me. I just yeah. wear it in the brakes, just pass them because you're super confident. But when you get there with those guys, yeah, it's just another level. But, um, Totally loved it, loved it, and and I think you, you often look back at, at your times there and you think, oh, that was so so special. But actually, when I was there, I was realizing I was in a special time. Mm. You know, I was riding there with when Swans arrived and Rainey arrived, Lawson, Gardner, all those together. You know, it's like Jesus, uh, th this is a this is a serious part of history here. Yeah. You know, and I'm just hanging on to it. I can, I'm got, I've got a really good view of it all. I'm just hanging on to them all. So it was a proper special time. And from like a technical side of things, because them them days I thought it was brilliant, you know, because right. it was more the mechanics had to get the bike set yeah. up right. They had to get the engine the engine setting right with a jet in and yeah, stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. The rider had to be on form on yeah. the on his day as well. Like yeah. everything had to come together. Nowadays it's more done by computers, and it's it's a lot more easier nowadays to to set a bike up. Well, it's still yeah. difficult, but you know it's a lot. They got a lot more technology. Yeah. So from that side of things, was that was that something like special? Obviously, you were coming in explaining what the bike was doing, and then the mechanics yeah. changing jet in and and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I don't think I was ever the the best test rider. I thought I knew what I wanted, but um, the, the uh, some of the guys could translate it better. But I mean, the the, the guys back in the in the in your garage just want you to know your feeling. You don't want any technical, you know. In, 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 in later years, I employed quite a lot of different types of riders who would come back in with so much technical advice. It's like, what a lot of bollocks. Do you know what I mean? Like, all, all the, yeah. the, the technical guy, the suspension man, your gearbox man, they only want to know what you're feeling yeah. and what that, what that feeling is. And, that's, and I was quite good at that, you know, but I never claimed to be anything more than that. But that, that worked fine. And um, I was lucky enough again to have some fantastic, like Olin's guys and Cal Carruthers was our engine guy. But like I say, back in the day, you had to do a plug chop at every every circuit, so f full gas, fifth, sixth gear, top it, and get dragged back by the back of a truck or something. And you know, then the guys straight off with the heads, and they'd be, you know, it's, there's so much more of a of a sort of um, feel about it all, and and uh, making the right decisions. Yeah. You know what I mean? And he couldn't really test things, you know, around when to do that, change the gearbox. And then you on the track you couldn't you couldn't simulate things or you couldn't you had not done it before. I mean, my the last job on a on an evening we'd do testing, so we test on Friday and the last job in the evening I would go back to my motor home. I'd be struggling and I'd maybe not going as quick as what I wanted to. Um, but like a typical racer's brain, you sit with your gear chart. And you had like six gears for every six options for for every gear and you'd be tracking you go oh, i feel like i could just do a two three hundred revs there yeah. by the time you got your gear chart ready you were flipping going to be the man the next day you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. and he'd give it to the to the engine he'd wait for his last job so he'd give you give you our choices to him and he'd fit the engine and you got to bed proper peaking ready for the next day yeah. and he'd do it again on saturday you know yeah. so it didn't quite work out yeah, yeah, that's how it used to be when I first got on one two fives and that, and then yeah. and then when I went and rode that RG, we used to do plug chop. Yeah, know, at the end at the end of the practice session, um, yeah, that down the start and finish straight plug chop it and then push it back push up. Push it back up. And I I love yeah. like because that's how yeah. I sh think I'm sort of the last generation to right. kind of experience that, and that was just mega to then go back on the five hundred and do it, do it was, again. Yeah. yeah, it was it was. Well, it's awesome. always a cool part of the day because you you like pretty intense and like you get on. You get on everybody anyway, although all your sort of mates, because it's like you're moving around the, the, the world and you're all flipping, you know, um, dicing with your death most Sundays and you get to Sunday night and everybody's, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so you're really close, but like the plug chop, so every, the whole grid would be at the end of the 
when they're checking flags out, the last lap, the whole grid would be packed. You know, so we're all having the crack and, and you know, it's all, it's quite a good part of the of the weekend. That was really. Um, yeah, it's really good. It was a good time. I think that'll lead us on to our last question then. Mm. Um what was the best and biggest party? Best and biggest party in your memory, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. I know in them days that it was um Yeah, yeah. There was no social media, so there was no people taking can't photos. Imagine, at all. I can't imagine what we. Well, you'd never survive at all. <laughs> um, I don't know. Some obviously your wife's here, so I can't talk about them, <laughs> most of them. But um, I don't know. Salzburg was was the, usually the, the 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 bigger the party, the scarier track. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. it's like you survived, like in Salzburg. <clears throat> I don't know if you ever been to Salzburg. No, 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 okay. no. no. Salzburg was it was fantastic, but you literally crap yourself like a couple of hours driving. As you get close to it, you start crapping yourself, and you drive in, and you crap yourself for like five days while you're there. And then when you drive out, it's like, oh my god. So usually the party on the Sunday night one it, were the ones who were still able bound because like honestly, every Sunday one of your mates would be hurt. Yeah, no question. And and like and, and that's another thing. Back in the day. I guarantee you, everybody on that grid was carrying something. Yeah. There was there wasn't one fit, hundred percent fit person on that grid. Whether it's flipping five hundred fingers, collarbones, back off, everybody was on that bike nursing something. So Sunday night, if you were still not too bad, uh, uh, tracks like that, um, they were good. So, and, and Salzburg, we used to go to a, <coughs> a restaurant uh, just outside the circuit, and everybody would go there and you'd just get mad. The, one of the really funny ones was with Neil. And there's a. Has he mentioned it? I think he's same one. I think he's mentioned the same one. Has he? Oh, right. <laughs> well, maybe put those drinks on Gary's on Gary's room bill. Oh, well. yeah, that, so. I think yeah. But the one the first time we went up there and Randy organised everything. There was everybody there, and we'd had a food, uh, had dinner, <clears throat> and we we ended up being a gang of about a dozen of us here, and there was like me and Neil and Randy and Eddie, all the sort of good guys and then the Honda guys are over there because I always thought Honda guys would rook themselves a little bit you know because they had the fastest bikes and they always looked posh didn't they so we always thought they looked stuff and and there was um, there was the main man from HRC and Roger Bennett was sat smooching like he does and uh, I picked my inverted schnitzel up and got it into like a snowball like that and I went like that and it to, to go over Roger and hit I was aiming for someone like miles away and it hit the roof and landed on the HRC's guy's lap this flipping greasy made the schnitzel so that was the sort of start of the night and then tradition there you end up getting in this like it's like a two gallon porcelain jug of lager and everybody would fill it up and you pass it round on the big table and honestly the about two gallons it's massive you couldn't pick it up and Mackenzie says introduce me and I'm like what introduce me I'm, I'm gonna, I'm going to swim up the Niagara Falls. I'm like, what? <laughs> so I'm looking at the table. Everybody's quiet. Introducing from Stirling in Scotland, Neil Mackenzie is going to swim up the Niagara Falls. And they went, Chuck! and just tipped it on his head and pretended to swim up the <laughs> And they just put everybody just completely so. So that, that's when it, it all kicked off there. Yeah, oh, that oh. wasn't the part uh, Neil said about. But yeah, yeah, I can imagine it being a, a similar oh, evening. It's got messy. Well, that, and then uh, that year, Porsche sponsored all the top drivers and they give them all they give them all uh, what did they give them all nine four four I think like Eddie Kevin there's lo loads of them and uh, so we all come out and Eddie went drinking we me and Neil opened his boot and jumped in his boot to go back to the track and, like he's, he's got to go on public roads and, and we're, me and Neil are sat in the back of his of his car like two flipping lap dogs and he's going get out of the trunk guys you know <laughs> <laughs> just pretty California come on guys um, yeah no so. We had a few more words for wear, but I'm not talking about them while the wife's here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant, Rob. Thank you for speaking to us. All right, no uh, problem. No, it's been a pleasure. Well, I look forward to seeing you. Have a good one. Yeah, no, brilliant. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed that, because I certainly did, about all the stories, the plug chopping, um, and the, the after parties as well. Certainly sounded good fun in them days with no social media back then. Um, so if you want to check us out more, make sure you like and subscribe. Subscribe to our website as well, because then you'll get emailed notifications on our up and coming events.